Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Let's Talk Housing. My name is Brennan Thomas. I am the co-host here alongside Stephen Thomas, the chief economist and founder of Reports on Housing. Today, we will discuss the most recent news and statistics, the latest Federal Reserve meeting, student debt impacting home ownership, mortgage rates, and of course, so much more. But first, Stephen, what is happening in the Thomas household? Oh, yes. I. Uh, what's going on in Thomas household? Just more of the same. We are stuck in the autumn. Uh, that's when the kids go back to school and we have fall sports. And that is when uh, our weekends are taken up cheering on our children. And uh, from cross-country invitationals to uh, flag football invitationals to uh, Mason, he's he's in a, a cross country club, and then Zeke is in soccer. So between the four of them, and then I like to throw in a referee game just for fun because I've been a referee for years. I will referee a game tomorrow morning before Zeke's uh, game. So we have to divide and conquer, and that's what we're doing. So that's basically the season that we're in. I feel like a a bit of an Uber, although we do have one driver in the house, so not that big of an Uber because we do have some help. That's what's going on for us. But how about you? Uh, I would ask you what's going on in your life. But I told you, I kind of prepped you. How do you feel about officiating in uh, soccer, specifically uh, for Arsenal games? So this is a dangerous topic for me that I feel like I could probably talk about for maybe an hour. So I'm not going to go on a complete tangent. But... um, I'm not super proud of what's what's been happening. However, I am proud of my team's performance. And I think that's really all that matters is that we showed some grit and we're still in like a fighting position. And I am just, there's so much to look forward to. I can't spend too much time reflecting on what's happened. However, I'd like to see some things change. Um, but I can't say I'm super proud of the decisions that have been made. I, we were talking about this before we were in recording for probably like 10 minutes where I was just going on and on and I'm just so passionate about it. It's like you always ask me like, oh, what's going on in your life? Like that's the first thing I think of because I'm always like reading about Arsenal. I'm always watching the games. I have to watch them live. I'm going to like this restaurant to watch it with a bunch of other people. It's just it's so, so much fun and it's always something to look forward to and I get to look forward to that tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. So I am more than ecstatic again. Always something to keep me on my toes and to keep me all excited. But that's been pretty much all that's going on in my life other than work and having fun with family and friends. But Stephen, what has happened over the past couple of weeks in the economy? Well, PCE came out today, and it was lower than everybody's expectations. Not a giant surprise. As a matter of fact, uh, we found uh, there, there's a, an economic firm that is so tired of CPI and PCE and, and they're the slow, uh, they, how the shelter uh, side of the index is, uh, is dragged out and how there's a delay in it. And they, what they did is they stripped out the way that they, they do shelter, and that's how they look at rents. And they actually put in real-time rents instead. And if you do that, just that alone, and you look at, uh, you look at core, core is actually below 2%. And this is kind of what, what we have been alluding to, that you need to stop focusing on inflation. Inflation's not the problem. You are making a mistake by not cutting uh, sooner. And so uh, that today's uh, showing that it's coming down means that that delay in owner equivalent rents really finally coming down. Uh, and it's pretty much down to 2%. Inflation is not not really the problem. Uh, it's next week. That's the big, big week. We have uh, jobs uh, next week. The big, yeah, that, that's, a, that's what's been going on in the economy. And also, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it plenty, uh, is the, of course, the uh, Fed. And just recently, I believe yesterday, so the 26th, we also saw the jobless claims continuing to decrease for at least initial claims. And what does that mean for um, going into jobs week? Yeah, you know what? I'm not, 
so there are some revisions in this, and there's other things that that keep people from from filing unemployment claims. Anyhow, part of it, uh, what goes into unemployment is they have to actually they they have to uh, go in and and uh, uh, apply for unemployment. There are some people that they when they're let go, they're given extra money up uh, up front. And there's some severance and there's different things. If you if you leave now, you'll get X. Uh, if you leave later, it's Y. And a lot of people take X. And then they don't file for unemployment right away. They go out there look, looking for a job and there might be a little bit of a delay. And then they do, they do uh, find a job. So it's not the perfect measure. And also, I've noticed that the last couple of them, I don't know if you've been watching, but what I've seen is that after they say that it's, it was down to 2000 or whatever, it's only down a little bit from the prior week. Then they revised the prior week and they revised it up. And that's happened a couple of times in a row. So, um, uh, but we're not seeing the trend. The trend is it's kind of flat. That's really what it's the trend shows me. And where is it going to be going be, beyond that? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, it's, it's, uh, but I don't think that, that is a prelude necessary, necessarily to what we will see next week. Uh, uh, I'll get out my popcorn because it's going to be an interesting week next week. That's for sure. So the hot topic for today's at least economic news side is what has happened over the uh, over the last Fed meeting. Yeah, so uh, the Fed cut the rates a half percent, and I was a bit leery. So I think uh, he did a Jerome Powell did the best he could to for damage control of not going earlier like they should have gone, and made it look like this was uh, the way that they needed to do it. They uh, came up with a new term kind uh recalibration so we've re the recalibration so what we've done is inflation's uh genie's getting back into the bottle and now we need to get uh we need to get in, in uh we need to bring it down enough so that uh it it buoys inflation numbers so that's kind of what they've done but um you know uh I don't necessarily buy it completely. I just think that they're they're trying to sell it to the markets so that there wouldn't be a oh my gosh, why in the world do they do a half percent? Because a half percent's not normal. We all know in economics land why they did a half percent. Half percent was because they realized that they should have gone in July. We were talking about they should have gone even earlier. But due to the fact that they waited in July and then jobs had this very poor performance like two days later, and then they realized, whoops. And uh, now this is them backpedaling and then selling it. Uh, if they only went a quarter percent, they would have been talking about all the ever, everything else that they would have been uh, doing. And then we probably would have got follow through on interest rates even going lower. But uh, that's not what happened. Instead, we got that half percent. He sold everybody on this recalibration. Uh, he sold people on other terms before. Um, uh, you know, the, why is it escaping me? All of a sudden, it's escaping me because I've been have, having all these late nights. But uh, last time they they said that uh, that it was transitory. That's the word I was looking for. The transitory uh, inflation that we had, um, and they sold everybody pretty well on it. But there got to, uh, uh, to a point by the time we got to like July of 2021 we knew the transitory that wasn't the issue it's it's now an official problem and they didn't come out and talk about it really being yeah you know what we might have been wrong with this transitory thing until the very end of 2021 and that delay was too long of a delay and then they didn't do anything until march so they're really slow on responding and they sell us on different on these different terms that's not a term that i can uh, get behind is this recalibration it doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense to me uh, because uh, that half percent, ah, it was uh, much ne much needed, but uh, they should have already been uh, going earlier. And the, the big change. So the dot plot also came out and that dot plot is them just forecasting where are interest rates or short term rates? Go where is it going to go? over the course of the rest of this year, next year, and even the following year. And not too many people are paying attention to 2026, but people will start really paying attention to 2026 very shortly because we'll be in 2025 and they'll start to really look at what those numbers are going forward. But in June, they do this every quarter. They come out with this dot plot. And it's just each of the uh, d different members, there's 19 of them, and they say where they think rates should be for this year, for next year. And then they 
put that on uh, a little dot as to where they think that the short-term rate should be. And these dots are kind of like all over the place. And you kind of, from that, determine where's the average or median dot, where is it at, and where are rates most likely going to be. Well, uh, they, they called for, when you looked at it in June, they were split between one and two. But overall, if you did the math, it was one, one rate cut, one rate cut of a quarter percent in June. And uh, then in, in uh, what we just had last week is now all of a sudden it's changed. Now it's not one. They did two uh, in uh, last week. And then they're going to do two more, one after the election, one in December. And so now that's four. So we went from one to four and then next year another four so uh that will bring it down uh they were at five and a half that will be bring it, the uh neutral rate is what they're trying to get towards down to three and a half there's an argument as to where this neutral rate is that means the rate is where it should be and they don't need to go uh if they go down it's too accommodating if they go up it's too restrictive but it's just right it's kind of like the goldilocks number and that changes over time so there's a big arguments as to where that where that neutral rate is but uh a lot of uh, economists actually do feel it's three and a half and that's what they're projecting out is three and a half uh but just in june they were uh, not at three and a half. They were at four and a quarter by the end of next year. So that's a big change. So a uh, big change from June to September in their thinking and also their talk. But they were talking a big game about how they're going to be able to get in front of this labor thing. And don't worry. We're, uh, now we're focusing on the right thing. Inflation's back in the bottle. Everything is like kumbaya. And uh, so you were, the, uh, the uh, landing is coming. It's just a slow descent and it's going to be a soft landing for the economy. Everything's going to be just perfect. And I, I just, I think that's very, very difficult. There are already people that are saying that they pulled it off, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, there are other economists that are still calling for a recession. There are not that many that are. I get them thrown at me all the time. Even if we went into a recession, the big thing is, is we'd see the short-term rate, federal funds rate drop even further. And with all the economic readings, we would see interest rates drop a lot more than where they, uh, further than where they are today. And it would ignite demand in the housing arena. People are going, well, there'll be more people that are unemployed. I don't really care if, if, if unemployment went from where it's at today at four point whatever uh, to uh, uh, 6%, let's say. There are, that means that there's still 94% of Americans that are still uh, gainfully employed and a lot of people that have wanted to purchase. Do you, don't you think a lot of those people that are renting would uh, look at this opportunity with really uh, a lot lower rates? They would jump right back into it. And that's what happens in recessions. This recession would, if, they, if one was to materialize, would not be caused by housing. It would be caused by something, uh, something else, a cooling economy. And what typically pulls us out of recession is that drop in rates. And then we get what? We get uh, real estate pulling the economy out of the recession. So that's kind of in a nutshell what went on last week. Oh, and another big thing is everybody was so shocked with what happened with rates. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. I, when Jerome Powell was done, because I listened to it live, I tried to get onto one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite sites and uh, that I go into often. I, it, you go into it as well. And that's where we go to Mortgage News Daily and look at what's going on with the uh, average mortgage rate across the United States with no points. You couldn't even access the site. It, it kind of like semi crashed because too many people were accessing it at the same time, expecting a half a percent drop in rates when we've been talking about it for a long time that that mortgage rates remember they kept the federal funds rate at five and a half percent nothing changed from uh july of last year all the way till uh till september of this year that's 14 months where they kept it just the same in that time we had interest rates that fell all that went all over the place to a high of eight percent to a low of 5.9 uh actually not 5.9 but uh, almost uh, what we just had, 6.1%, uh, like a week ago. You know what? That is, uh, that's a big spread in mortgage rates, yet the short-term federal funds rate was the same. What happens is they, uh, the federal funds rate, I mean, the uh, interest rates in the 10-year treasuries, long-term bonds, 
move and all bonds, they move where they think the Fed is going to go and where they think the economy is going. And the economic readings that come out kind of tell them what the Fed's going to do. They look at every single data point because that's what the data, that's what the Fed said is look at the data. We're constantly looking at data. So every single data point has been moving the market and it will continue to because they've left it like that. And uh, so every data point is moving the market. And so when we got to the rate cut day, actually rates went up a little bit. And then the following day, we had the stock market go up like 500 points or something like that. And then rates went up further that day. So, so two days afterwards, and they've been, they continue to go up this week with not that much news or anything. So I think they're at 6.2 right now. They were at a low of 6.11. So not a giant swing or anything, but that comes with future reports such as the jobs report next week. And what have you seen over the past couple of weeks with uh, supply, demand, and expected market time? Shoot. Yeah, supply and demand. So... um Finally, what we're kind of seeing is that not a whole heck of a lot of change in, in supply. And this is the, of course, we look at a lot of markets and uh, markets across the United States are going to behave the same, very similarly to what we're seeing. What we're seeing is that the mortgage rates, I mean, not mortgage rates, mortgage rates, are, yes, mortgage rates are starting to impact the, the marketplace. And we're starting to get this inventory topping out, even though we have more homes coming on the market right now than we did last year, but still far fewer than the number that we were placing on the market prior to COVID. So what we, uh, because of that, so far this year, we had a demand curve that was very similar to last year. So we had a very, very similar closed sales as well as the demand that we were looking at. But because we were placing more homes on the market than last year, they, uh, the, if you have the same demand curve and you're placing more homes, we saw the inventories rise and the inventories kept on rising all year, from, especially from the spring all the way till we got to a couple of weeks ago. We kept on watching it rise, rise, rise. But now uh, that interest rates are much, much lower than they were at seven and a half in, in April. Now they're playing and, and 6.2 is high. So uh, and there's more pressure for rates to drop even further. Now you're getting a lot of buyers, especially now that the Fed finally met and they did that rate cut. A whole bunch of people flooded the market thinking, oh, my gosh, this is a great time. Rates just came down, although rates were already uh, baked into the equation. So what what we're seeing is that inventories because demand is actually going up that's the big surprise right now it's that green shoot that we're waiting for to come off of last year's flat line and it was it was uh creating that bottom well we matched the bottom we were just playing around with last year's numbers it would be a little bit above it would be a little bit above uh, below that type of thing and but now all of a sudden we have this breakout within the last two weeks you can see the demand has definitely risen in most markets that we're following. And overall, when you add it all up, that's demands up and inventories flat. So what happens when you have demand flat and soon we'll get it uh, peaking out, we'll see demand and we'll see inventory coming down. So we have inventories that are flat. And so it's going to start to come down. And we got demand that went up at the same time that we have inventories flat and then later go down. What happens when we add more demand, more buyers? It's very easy to come off this bottom because it's very few transactions. Now, all of a sudden, with inventory, with uh, uh, I mean, interest rates cooperating, we're getting more demand in the marketplace. So what that does is it's really easy to come off that bottom. So we have demand actually rising at a time when we don't usually see demand rising during this time period. And the last time you could see actually demand rising in this time of the uh, year was we have to go all the way back to the Great Recession when there was first time homebuyer tax credits that were monkeying with demand at the time. So this is actually interest rates coming down and it's fueling some demand. So we're getting demand coming up. So what's happening with market times, expected market time, the speed of the market is all of a sudden getting faster. Also not normal for this time of the year. All of a sudden we got this big drop in the expected market time. So uh, that's just right now. We'll have to see as we go forward, especially if rates dip below 6% because we're right now knocking on 6%. We haven't been below this since August of 2022. We're almost there. It could take one jobs report where, oh my gosh, way fewer jobs, kind of like this PCE inflation report that came out today. If we get that next Friday, a week from today when we're uh, recording this, you know what? We can dip below that 6% and get into the fives. So, and that we're off to the races for the housing market if we get into the fives. So in reaction to mortgage rates hovering near lows, we haven't seen in over a year. And you talking about demand starting to pick up. Um, is it safe to say that housing is finally moving? 
versus how it was so stuck before. Yeah, it's finally coming off of it's it's kind of uh, been frozen solid and it's starting to heat up a little bit. This is just the beginning. We really need rates to come down below 6% for this thing to get going. And I, like I, I, one of those things is Fannie Mae does a, does a uh, economic and housing forecast every single month. And if you looked at where they were in June to where they were, just to where they are right now in September, all of a sudden they're talking fives next year. And they were not talking about that at all three months prior. So now all of a sudden you can see they're projecting out where rates are going to be in the fives. So that's where we'll really see some movement. So right now we're starting to thaw. It's just starting to thaw. But we can really see a lot more activity and uh, things will really be moving uh, when rates get even lower, we can get into the fives, but it doesn't mean it'll be off to the races necessarily right away because it's matching up at a really slow time of the year, but it's coming and it's going to set up a 2025 start contrary to this year where we had rates that were rising and we got back up to seven and a half percent. So ugly rates that were stuck above 7%. That's the threshold that really slows the market. Can you imagine if we were stuck below 6% during the same time period? That matches up with the market's busiest time of the year, the opposite of what 2024 was all about. So if uh, th th this is going to be uh, most likely a really good time for rates, to, a patch coming for, uh, that's coming up. So who do you see has the power in the market right now? Would it be buyers, sellers, or would you say it's a little bit more of a balanced market? Yeah, it's what I refer to as the most buyer-friendly market that we've seen in a long time. As a matter of fact, it depends upon the market. Some markets, it's like the, the bet, like in Los Angeles County, it's the best market since 2014 at this time of the year. So holy cow, that's fantastic. Others, it's like back to 2019. And 2019, and then it's still others, it was 2017. It just depends upon where it's at. It means that it's more buyer friendly for sure. And uh, does that mean it's a buyer's market? Well, with where rates are at, there are certain markets like Los Angeles County uh, that is actually, they're peeling off a little bit of value right now. Know that this is temporary. So uh, if it's a buyer's market, it would be only slight, and that's from uh, too many sellers competing against each other. And uh, I think, like, for example, Orange County, L.A., they're lumped together. Orange County beats the socks out of L.A. as far as market times are concerned. But when they're lumped together, the like for the last month, uh, the home price index from Freddie Mac actually was down a half percent for that metro. And so what does that tell you? That doesn't mean that anything's falling like really fast. What it does tell you is this is a really good time to be a buyer right now. And I, it's this window of opportunity where there are a lot more uh, homes that are on the market than we've seen in, in quite some time. It's right at like almost 2022 levels. And that's fantastic. That's uh, number one. Number two, rates have come down. And number three, there's a sluggishness to the marketplace where it's more balanced. Some markets, you have to know your market are a little bit more leaning in the buyer's uh, direction. Know that, that, like I said, that's temporary because what's going to happen is uh, demand is only going to increase. Inventories are about to uh, peak out and then they're going to go down for the rest of the year. And regardless of how slow the year is, the very end, inventories really peel off. And they, they get down to its lowest level by the time we get to December 31st. And that will then, uh, by the time we get the second week of uh, January, now we're into the winter market. The holidays are done. And that's when there are not a lot of homes coming on the market, but there's a lot of buyers that enter the marketplace. And now, and not a lot to, to see out there, that's a recipe. And these low rates, it's just going to feel more of it. And the competition's going to be a lot more fierce. So what does that tell you? If you're a buyer and you want a really good marketplace, right now is it. So a question in regards to mortgage rates is how far can interest rates drop over time? Uh, like what's the bottom that we may see? Yeah, 3%. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got their fingers. Yeah, if you didn't see it and you're hearing this right now, I have to tell you that Brennan, who is uh, you know, he's he's a lot younger than I am and not a homeowner yet, renting with his brothers and his uh, cousin, had his fingers crossed. So I understand where they're coming from. It's definitely it's, uh, millennials and uh, Gen Z 
They definitely, they're the ones that want this thing to be different. That's why 50% of millennials and Gen Z uh, expect the housing market to crash, which is not going to happen. But so what they need is that cooperation with exactly what he's doing. Keep your fingers crossed that rates drop a lot. And if we go into that mini recession that's, that very few economists, but some are uh, talking about uh, for next year, shoot. If we got into that, uh, we'd see rates come down a lot more than than uh, what what they're uh, uh, forecasted to come down right now or projected even by the Fed. The markets would then recalibrate and rates would drop pretty, pretty uh, swiftly. So um, where do I think that they could bottom out? Well, the big thing is the spread. And let me explain this really quick. So I follow the 10-year treasury all the time, as do you, as do most lenders. And the reason they do that is because when the yields on the spread, when it goes down, and I go to CNBC all the time to tell me where it's at real time, and when it goes down and it's in the red, that means interest rates go down. There's this kumbaya relationship uh, between 10-year treasuries and 30-year mortgage rates. So uh, what happens is if, if people are not buying equities, uh, like that means like the, the stock market, they're totally involved in the stock market, but they see the, the economy is slowing. They don't like to play as much in the stock market. Now they're a little scared that we're going to get towards recession. So where do they park their money? They move it out of these equities and they move it to what? Longer term issuance of debt. And that is they want to invest in 10 year treasury mortgage bonds and 30 year mortgage rates, which are mortgage backed securities. So what happens when they invest in that, all of a sudden those interest rates go down. They don't make as much because if everybody's interested in the same time, they're not going to pay as much. So the interest rates uh, for 10 year treasuries go down for uh, mortgage backed securities. So interest rates go down kind of hand in hand. And so there's this normal spread and that spread going back in time, I just recalibrated it to take in the most recent data. It's now, it was like a 1.71 something. Now it's at 1.75 if you take into this account the most recent time period. So even averaging it out to like last week, 1.75 is, so if whatever the 10 year treasury is, you can add 1.75 and that's where rates should be. Based upon that math, we should have interest rates right now if there was the spread was back to normal, which is where it was from 2012 to 20 uh, to 20, right before this 2020, uh, before we got into COVID, those spreads were normal. And, and so we should have interest rates at five and a half percent right now. Now, it, but the spreads were even worse. And if you look at their spreads where they were back in November, we should have interest rates right now at uh, 6.75%. We're at 6.2. So you can see that it's actually gotten better, but we still have a lot, lot ways to go to get down to 5.5%. That spread is going to get better in time. A. So we should be already at 5.5%. Eventually, we'll get there. And we then feel that, the, that uh, if the market slows more, if there's more turbulence in the economy, which we think is uh, going to happen because the Fed was so late, and they're not telling us everything. They sold us a bag of goods right now. Really good at the sales pitch, but I don't know. That doesn't mean that that's what the economy is going to do. So I think it's going to be more turbulence, not going into recession, but definitely slow down quite a bit more than what some people are anticipating. That is enough to knock, knock it down where let's say then that the Fed has to do something and they don't go down to three and a half. Instead, they go to two and three quarters. Now, all of a sudden, we're down to interest rates in the high fours. So you can see that there is a pathway to the high fours. That's where I think that, that uh, we could see interest rates come down. And if we get into a recession, which some people are calling, it could get even lower into the fours. So that's off, off uh, in the distance. That's not anytime uh, soon, but that's uh, kind of where I, uh, I see things going. With home prices extremely high and mortgage rates still hovering about pre-pandemic numbers, can a 40-year fixed mortgage rate be the key to fixing affordability? Uh, I'm not. I, I want rates to come down. This 40-year fixed thing, is uh, it's like putting a Band-Aid on, on the overall problem. Let's instead, let's fix the problem. The problem is that we need, I've said this before, I'll say it again. We need a government to figure out how to reach across the aisle and figure things out so that we can build more properties. We can change zoning. Things aren't as expensive. The fees aren't outrageous. It's easier to uh, sell a home. There's incentives to, after stripping out all these extra fees and everything else, how about incentivizing to build the entry level? There's different things that they can do policy-wise. I'd like to see a lot of focus on that then 
focus on, hey, yeah, let's do the 100-year uh, mortgage. Yeah, you know what? Shoot, that doesn't make any sense. You want a 40-year mortgage? That uh, You're going to be, what, 70 when you pay it off? That's kind of lame. <laughs> Not kind of lame, really lame. So uh, let's fix let's fix, fix the market in other ways. Not look for easy fixes with these weird lending that they, that they try to do these like workarounds. That's not fixing the issue. The issue is supply. Are the build to rent communities a part of the solution in this context or a problem for the housing crisis? It seems to be becoming more of a trend. Yeah, I mean, and it's definitely you have to have the land to be able to to build these things, but they build these communities. Uh, there are a lot of families that can't afford to uh, purchase. So instead they can rent. They don't have the big down payments. So instead they're going to rent and, and they would rather live in a home. So they're, uh, I can see a place for these. Uh, I'm just not really keen on the amount of, uh, of uh, the, the number of investors that are out there, especially really the way that the, a lot of the investment works is you take California, where it's nice and sunny and warm in Nevada, and then you go down the Sun Belt and you go along the coast, you get to uh, you get to uh, 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 Florida. That's where you have a lot of this investment, and it's not necessarily. And it's people say, well, it's not that many for the overall marketplace, but really, you can see some communities, especially the entry level, when you start to look at the number of investors in there, and you go, well, holy cow, people can't even get loans in some of these communities because there are too many investors in there, and. Uh, there, there's uh, like FHA won't lend if there are too many investors. So that that's uh, that's an issue. So uh, I, I think that we have to definitely also think through both sides of the aisle getting together and looking at, um, so, you know, not incentivizing, uh, uh, you know, investors to invest, invest in building this kind of uh, product. We need to look at other solutions and I'd rather them be uh, building, uh, you know, homes that they can, sell to the entry level, not cater to the entry level and create housing that they then rent forever and don't turn these things into actual units that any, anybody can ever own. A study well explained by Odetta Kashi, chief economist of First American, uh, broke down how rising student debt delays home ownership for many. So Stephen, what are your thoughts on this as um, tuition has only gone up as many things have over the years? and um, I mean, of course, housing has just gotten more expensive as well. Yeah, I and mean, it doesn't doesn't help. Uh, absolutely, when rates were lower, it wasn't it was not that big of an issue. But prior to rates uh, getting down as low, I mean, the student debt problem has been a problem for a long time that that uh, everybody's been uh, talking about. As, but in a, a lot of statistical analysis, and I've got to look at Odetta's. Uh, actual uh, analysis, it, I can understand that it affects housing right now with interest rates as high as they are. And it would definitely skew the data because there's a lot of people that can't even afford to purchase, period, right now. Affordability really improves as interest rates drop. So I'd be really interested to see that study as interest rates come back, back down to more normal levels, not these interest rates that are juiced by the Federal Reserve. Because I saw the studies prior to uh, prior to the uh, Federal Reserve jacking up uh, rates. And you really had a hard time proving with data that it prevented uh, uh, students from home ownership. There were a lot of, not students, but student debt from preventing home ownership. You had a real hard time. And I even, I even uh, think it was studies done by uh, uh, First American back in the day that actually proved the contrary. So it'd be really interesting. I have not read the, the, that particular study, but I'm sure that it has a lot to do with where interest rates are at right uh, today. Which, by the way, I want everybody to know out there, I do not see any of these questions prior to the uh, podcast. We do that intentionally so that, and then I read through them so I get familiar with them and I ask a few of the different clarifying questions if I don't quite understand what, they, what the question is totally stating. And because uh, I had somebody ask me yesterday, they said, oh my gosh, your podcasts are incredible. Your son uh, does such a great job. Uh, and, but uh, who comes up with the questions? Because they thought it was me. And it's not me. It's, it's not I have my hand up. <laughs> it's Brennan. And Brennan yeah, he has his hand up for a podcast. That's funny. 
<laughs> it's yeah, Brennan comes up with this thing. These are great questions. And he comes up and he peppers me with uh, different questions. I totally enjoy it. And, uh, and, and, and uh, so uh, everything about the, this podcast is brought to you by Brennan Thomas, not Stephen Thomas. So uh, I just need to clarify that for everybody that's listening. Yeah, these are authentic conversations that you and I typically have. I mean, day to day, I'm always asking you these questions and you're calling me and we're talking about these things. So it's just turning it into a recorded version is all that it is. It's just so that people can get a better understanding as to what's happening here and now. And like you say, just set proper expectations to going forward to really be knowledgeable and be able to explain this to other people. That way they are mentally fit. So. <laughs> Exactly. But yeah. And just one last question for you, Stephen, is we are about a month away from November, which is absolutely crazy to say. I talked about that last time with the holidays just being right around the corner. Can the election impact the housing market or interest rates? And I know you have a quick answer for this. So go ahead. <laughs> no. A lot of people. And I'm glad I didn't really hear that much about uh, the Fed being political. I thought I'd hear more of it uh, when they made the half half a point cut. Um, it, the Fed, they're a bunch of nerds. They might have it wrong a lot of times in our uh, not so humble opinion, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, the, at the end of the day, uh, they're, they don't they do things that have nothing to do with the, uh, the politics of things. They're just late to the party on making these rate cuts. A, them. The actual election, I can tell you right now, the election's right around the corner and all of a sudden we got this bump in demand. We weren't supposed to get the bump. It was supposed to really slow down. All of a sudden, uh, the election was supposed to slow down the whole process of real estate and everybody would take a, take a little slowdown, wait for the outcome of this election. That's not how we work. We work by our pocketbooks. And uh, so if rates were to actually rise enough, we would actually see fewer people transact. And that has everything to do with rates, not the election. Rates are now coming down and they're much lower than where they were before. Now we're seeing a boost in demand. It's not the election that's, that's people are excited about it. So we're going to go buy a house. That's not what's going on. It is it's John, John Burns out of uh, Newport Beach. He said it right, and, and that's uh, that it does not affect uh, the uh, election. And he did all the data across the United States to prove it. I did the data in all the markets that we cover, but that's not enough. It wasn't the whole entire United States, but based upon everything that I looked at, it never affected a uh, an election uh, before in the Bay Area. It didn't affect elections over here in uh, uh, Calif Southern California either. And it's just doesn't affect elections. And and we looked at, uh, you know, the the uh, presidential election. Then we looked at, you know, the in-between election. My, uh, like I said, not a lot of sleep. Can't remember all my terms right now, but um, it, it does not affect elections. No. So people need to stop asking that. They're going to see articles written about it. Please, if you see any data that proves their case, bring it my direction. Can't wait to see it. Can't wait to eat that up. Yum, yum, yum. I'll chew it all up. Yes, yes. I will. And then I will give myself, you know, a make up. I'm so sorry that I uh, went out on a limb and said that it doesn't affect elections. Uh, you have to show me the data because data doesn't exist. I've been saying this for years. It doesn't exist. We'll have to retouch on this topic in about a month from now and a lot more conversations are going to be brought up, oh, but this is a good, uh, this is a good before the fact. So this is, we're getting ahead of time right now. So like we said, setting proper expectations, but thank you everyone again for tuning into another episode of Let's Talk Housing. If you want to learn more about what's going on in the real estate world or in the economic landscape, feel free to check out our YouTube or subscribe today at reportsonhousing.com. Please leave us a good review. And if you have any questions, like usual, you can post it to any of our social media platforms, or you can even email me at info at reportsonhousing.com. We will see you very soon and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.